two, I said Philippians. I didn't really mean the Philippians. You uh, get it. It's Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, chapter number two, page number twelve seventy one in your Scofield Reference Bible. The text I want to speak to you from uh, is in verse number thirteen and uh, fourteen. I'd like for you to mark the two verses in your Bible. And then there's a conclusion based upon the two verses in verse number 15 I'd like to emphasize as well. But we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. And I notice that uh, is in one unit. Usually you'd have a comma after the word brethren, but it's in one unit. We have the comma, then the word brethren, and following that, beloved of the Lord. That's an unusual term. It's a precious term, and yet it's a common, it's a common term uh, that we find in the Bible, but not, not uh, usually in this uh, sentence construction. We give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the foundation chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of, of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, or to obtaining eternal life. Therefore, because of that great truth, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, that is, the things that have been taught you. Stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle, and then a benediction, in the last two verses of the chapter, uh, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us uh, everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and every good word and every good work. A good benediction at the closing of the chapter. I, I couldn't help but think about our Sunday school lesson a moment ago. And in verse 3 of our Sunday school lesson, we were exhorted in relation to our foundations. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And now here Paul speaks to the Thessalonian believers, hold, stand fast, and hold the traditions. Hold the foundations. Remove not the ancient landmarks that our fathers have set, which I think to be a very important word of admonition to the church in Paul's day or in 1989. There are certain truths of the Bible that we just cannot turn loose. We are not to forsake. Uh, in our day, the liberals and the modernists would pin knife the Bible and cut the Bible to pieces. And uh, so the new translations are bad about that. Uh, I read no less than 17 verses that have been omitted from the NIV translation. Uh, verses that are found in the KGV. But in the NIV, they're not even in the uh, text at all. It's completely dropped out. And if a person had never seen a KGV Bible, they would have never known that they're in the Bible. They don't even put them in the Senecalian reference or at the bottom of the page to remind the readers that the KGV has these verses in its content. Just dropped out completely. That ought not be. And I can't have the confidence in a translation of the Bible that will omit uh, 14 or more verses. Just drop them completely out of the text entirely. And then many other verses are so changed and so chopped up and uh, wrestle with until it's hard to recognize them to be the scriptures at all in the NIV. And that's true about the uh, Good News for Modern Man. It's true about the RSV. And it's true about the uh, NASV. And some of the other translations that are being uh, put on the market nowadays. And they say that these are better translations than the King James. But when you begin to whittle out at the heart of the King James Bible and leave out verses, I don't see how by any, any stretch of the imagination you could say it's a better Bible. I think that would disqualify a translation from being even a good translation, let alone a better translation than the King James when you leave out parts of the Scripture that are evidently, as far as I'm concerned, ought to be in the canon of God's Word. All right, so much for that. Look at verse 1. Uh, here's a text, a context that oftentimes we hear and we read about and study. And I preach from uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 
1 through 12, many times in my life. And I plan to keep on the Lord willing preaching from him many times in my life. But not ever have I preached on verses 13 and 14 and 15 until I shall attempt to do so today. But I'd like to read the context of why I deal with the text of the hour. Now we seek you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering, our gathering together with unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or trouble, neither uh, by uh, spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is not at hand, he's saying. And they, but there were some who were saying that the day of Christ has already transpired, and the second coming of Christ has already been a reality, and they are quoting Paul, uh, misquoting Paul would be a better way to say it. And Paul said, don't be troubled, don't believe that, either by spirit or by word or by letter as from us, uh, that the day of the Lord has come. And then in verse 2 he said, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the day of Christ, the second coming of our Lord, shall not come except there come a Paul in the way first. And that's the apostasy. The Greek word for Paul in the way, we transliterate and get our English word apostate. And the apostasy is going to come. And that apostasy involves a fall in a way from the truth once delivered unto the saints. We see all kind of evidence of that in our day. And I think we now be in the day of the fall in the way. Uh, it's already commenced, commenced in this century. And it's mounting up every year as the years pass by. There are men that uh, one time stood the Bible that pervert it and deny it and change it. And they change their doctrines along with it. Uh, well, DJ, Paul said, the day of Christ will not come except first that come of all in the way. And I think the apostasy that he has in mind there is the day in which you and I live, uh, the apostasy of the Laodicean church, the seventh church of the, of the uh, seven in Revelation 2 and 3. And that's in our day. Not in the days of Paul, but in our day. Uh, those seven letters are symbolic of the entire church period from the apostles down until the day in which you and I live. And they are, they are, they are chronological in order. Uh, the first letter to the church at Ephesus is the church of the apostles. And then the second, the church at Smyrna, is the uh, reference to the first day of early Christian persecution, Acts chapter 8. And then in chronological order, they bring you right down through the years until our day, 1989, with the church of Laodicea. And I think that's the day in which we now live and the falling away. Then the second thing that must come at the second coming of our Lord is the revelation of the man of sin, the uh, son of perdition. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The revelation of the Antichrist and the rapture will be almost simultaneous. Uh, I don't know which will be first, but in either case, it won't be first long. Uh, almost at the identical moment uh, when the man of sin appears, the church will be wretched out. And I said that to say the church will not be in any part of the seven years of Jacob's trouble. We are delivered from that time of tribulation. You can be assured of that. So these things must come to pass first. The falling away and the revelation of the man of sin. Uh, and then uh, the rapture will take place. And the second coming of our Lord in the rapture will then be a reality. Now about this son of perdition in verse number 4, the Bible describes him as he who opposes and uh, exalted himself. Above all that's called God, he opposes all that call God, themselves God. He opposes the God of the Bible. He opposes the scriptures of the Bible. And not only does he oppose the Bible, but he exalts himself above Jehovah God and above Jesus Christ or any other uh, uh, God, a form of God that may be worshipped. So that he as God, he's not God, but as God sitteth in the newly built temple. And that temple will be rebuilt uh, as far as I'm concerned, certainly in the time of the first part of the tribulation period, the first three and a half years. And I think the abomination of desolation will be committed at the middle of the three and a half, of the seven years, and but in the first part, a time of relative peace and plenty and prosperity. And in that first three and a half years, under the rule of the Antichrist, 
Israel will rebuild the temple. And so at the end of the rebuilding of the temple, he's going to sit himself in the temple, showing himself that he is God, claiming that he is God, and demanding the Jew to make an animal sacrifice on the new altar to him. And blinded Israel are going to do that. They're going to make an animal sacrifice to the Antichrist. And when that happens, uh, Daniel called that the abomination of desolation. And our Lord certified it in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, who so read it, let him understand, stand in the holy place. And that's when the Antichrist will show himself that he's God and require Israel to make a sacrifice unto him as God and blinded Israel will attempt to do that. Jesus said, when that happens, then shall be great tribulation, such as such the world has never seen or ever will see, and except those days be shortened, there be no flesh left upon the, uh, the earth, but for the elect's sake, and that's Israel, those days are going to be shortened somewhat, uh, the set last three and a half years of the seven. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, evidently when Paul was with the Thessalonian church, he went over these things. They are matters of Bible prophecy, and they are written down in your Bible and mine, that we might study Bible prophecy. And Paul went over these things and said so uh, in verse number, number five with the Thessalonian church. And I take that as a matter of fact. And now you know what withholdeth that he may reveal, that's the Antichrist, may be revealed in his time. And he cannot be revealed until his time comes. And in verse six, there's a suggestion that there is one who withholdeth the climax of the mystery of iniquity. And we're told who that one is in verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, has been working down from the first temptation of the devil to covet the throne of God. The mystery of iniquity has been working, has been coming slowly but surely to a climax. But uh, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will continue to let until he be taken out of the way. The word let there, actually in our use of the word today, would mean hinder. Only he who now hinders will continue to hinder the mystery of iniquity until he be taken out of the way. And beyond any doubt, a reference to the Holy Spirit of God, God's great executive on the earth today. He is the hindering factor of the mystery of iniquity. And were it not for the ministry of the Spirit of God, the devil would run wild and the mystery of iniquity would climax uh, prematurely. And so God allows the Holy Spirit uh, to hinder the climax of the mystery of iniquity until his time was right. And then when the time is right, in verse number eight, that wicked one, in the center column, it says the lawless one, uh, the Antichrist. In verse three, he's called the son of addiction. In verse three, he's called also the man of sin. And back in Daniel chapter nine, He's called the, the beast. And in Revelation 13, he's called the beast out of the sea. And uh, he's going to appear. Then shall that wicked one be revealed. And he can't be revealed until in the economy of God, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn. But one day the Spirit of God will be taken out of the earth. And I believe that day will be the day of the rapture. He'll take us out himself and leave the world when he takes the church out of the world, both the dead in Christ and the living in Christ. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the uh, brightness of his coming. Uh, sounds much like Revelation 19, doesn't it? At Armageddon. When the Antichrist gathers this great army of 200 million people at Armageddon, ready to besiege the city of Jerusalem, and assure himself the throne of David, Jesus shall come at that moment in power and great glory. And we're told in Revelation 19, he's going to destroy the armies, 200 million, by the sharp two-edged sword that proceeds out of his mouth and by the brightness of his appearing. And the sharp two-edged sword is a picture of the power of his spoken word. He's going to speak and that vast army will die. Every man, kings and mighty men and captains will die and flesh-eating fowls will eat the flesh off their bones in Revelation 19. 
the armies gathered at Megiddo for the battle of Armageddon. Even him whose coming, the Antichrist is described further in verse 9, whose coming is after the working of Satan. The whole strategy is the device of the devil. And he's coming with all power, and he's coming with signs, and he's coming with lying wonders, miracles that are not miracles but lies. They are false miracles, and that's why Paul called them lying wonders. They're not real. They are brought on by man, and they have no part of divinity about them. And then number four, he's coming with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so here are four things that will characterize the coming of the Antichrist and describe what he's going to be like uh, in verses 9 and 10. And for this cause, because men uh, would not receive the love of the truth, because Israel in particular would not receive the love of the truth, and men in general would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, for that cause... God shall send among them and to them strong delusion. Now, a delusion is deception. Uh, many people are given delusions. Uh, God has permitted some, no doubt, to be given a delusion. And all of these are given a delusion by God himself. These that will not accept Jesus as the real Messiah and who are anxiously making a sacrifice on a new altar to the Antichrist, and they will not receive the love of the truth. They have no part with the Bible. They want no part of the Bible. They want no part with the truth. God shall send upon them a strong delusion. That's a real deception, sure enough, that overwhelms them, and th that they should believe a lie. And the lie they're going to believe at the second coming of our Lord <laughs> in power and great glory at the close of the tribulation period or during the tribulation period, in fact, but climaxing at the close of the tribulation period, the lie they're going to believe is that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, is the real Messiah whom Isaiah prophesied about and other prophets prophesied about, whom we believe to be Jesus Christ our Lord. They won't believe that. They won't accept that. And the Jews right now around the world will not believe in the truth. They have no love for the truth. And because of their lack of love for the truth, God shall send among them a strong delusion. And that strong delusion will cause them to fervently believe that the Antichrist is the Messiah. Now the reason for that is given in the next verse, that they all might be damned. All the unbelievers with strong delusion shall be damned. Uh, who believe not the truth, but who have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that's a sad picture, isn't it? But that's what the world is marching forward to. And the time is going to come when these conditions described in 2 Thessalonians 2 will prevail among Israel and among the people of the world as well in relation to the Messiah, the false Messiah, the Antichrist. And that strong delusion is the act of God who allows it and permits of the people to be so strongly deceived until they're going to believe the lie that they all uh, might be damned who believe not the truth of God, but who actually, on the other side of the ledger, have pleasure in unrighteousness. They're so brainwashed and they're so given a delusion until they're really excited about their deception. They wouldn't call it deception. They would call it truth. But by the standard of the book, it's a strong delusion. And I want to say to you, my friend, that any religious truth that doesn't meet the standard of God's holy word is a delusion. Amen. And it's a lie. And don't you dare believe anything the Bible doesn't teach. There is no x-ray revelations. If a man comes to you and tells you he's had a new revelation from God that's not written in the Bible, don't you believe a word of that. Don't you dare believe that. As far as I'm concerned, the Bible is totally finished. And there'll not be an extra revelation given to anybody. Anybody. Joseph Smith said, I have an extra revelation. And he fostered that off on the Mormon church, and they believe it until this day. Don't you be sucked in on a thing like that.
And there's some Pentecostal people nowadays who are claiming to have extra revelations from God. One preacher I read in the Greenville paper said that I spent five, five and a half days with Jesus in heaven. If I've ever read a lie, a religious lie, that's it. And that pic, my paper had a picture of man, an old gray-headed man, older man as, I, as old as I am, I suppose. But he lied. He lied to the people. He lied when he put that in the paper. No man hath ascended up to heaven at any time but he that came down from heaven. You better believe John 3. And a man tells you he's been to heaven and spent time with Jesus in heaven and came back to this earth. Uh, that's a violation of the scripture. Therefore, that's a lie. You're a fanatic. You're a fundamentalist. That's exactly right. I'm both. I'm fanatical about the Bible. I'm a fundamentalist in relation to the Bible. And if a thing, if a thing doesn't par with the Bible, then it doesn't par with me. It's a negative with me. It's an untruth to me, you see. Whatever the Bible says, it's truth forever. But what the Bible doesn't say, you be skeptical about that. Don't you dare take that. Don't you believe that. A man can give you chapter and verse for truth, then you open your Bible and see if he's given the right chapter and the right verse. If he has, say hallelujah. If he hasn't, say be gone, be gone. I want no part with your doctrine. You believe the Bible. That they all might be damned, they're going to believe a lie that they might be damned. And the whole family of Israel will be damned. Uh, that is those in the tribulation period who believe in the Antichrist as the Messiah. And not only the Jews, but Gentile people as well after the church is raptured out who believe that the Antichrist, you remember in Revelation 13 it says that the world will say, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war against the beast? And they're going to say, great and wonderful is the beast. Right? You read that in Revelation 13. They're going to be totally brainwashed by the Antichrist. And many Gentiles, along with blinded Israel, will believe the lie and be damned because they have not believed the truth of God. Now that's uh, familiar. All of you are familiar with that. I preach from it so many times. But I want you to drop down to my text in verse number 13. But here's a conjunction. Here's a contrast. A rather dark picture, verses 1 through 12. A very hopeless, very desolate picture, a picture of sin, a picture of unfaith, a picture of ruin, a picture where God's people, his elect chosen people, uh, fall short and are totally blinded and brainwashed by the devil and the mystery of iniquity. To the degree that they believe a lie, sad, sad state. The church is gone, raptured out, preachers are gone, the pulpits are silent as far as the gospel is concerned. And the world been taken over by the devil's uh, gospel and by the devil's church, the church of the Antichrist. No truth is given forth in the pulpit. And all the world will rejoice and have pleasure in that kind of unrighteousness in the time of the tribulation period. But here's a contrast, verse 13. He's talking now basically to the Thessalonians to whom he writes, but we are bound Paul and his company of workers who worked with him in his missionary tours to establish the church of Thessalonica, a Gentile situation, by the way. But we're bound to give thanks always to God for you, believers in the, uh, in the church at Antioch, uh, at Thessalonica. And so it is down through the years, we're always bound to give God thanks for the local church who believes the Bible, who will stand up for the Bible. I give God thanks for Tabernacle. If ever I've known a fundamental Bible-believing church is Tabernacle. And I'm so proud of you. You encourage me. And I get, I get the, uh, 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 a lot of flack uh, from the religious world because I'm an independent and because I'm a fundamentalist. And I get a lot of flack because I'm a Baptist. Well, I've never found it in my heart to apologize for being either one of the three. Certainly not apologize for being a Baptist. I'm proud to be a Baptist. I always have been, so always be. But I'm a believer in Jesus Christ as my Lord and my personal Savior. But by denominational preference, I'm a Baptist. And I want people to know that. And I'm proud of Tabernacle because you feel the same way about your faith and about your Bible and about your Savior 
Lord Jesus, you are fundamental Bible believers. A man come and pin knife the Bible as it's being done in our day. Uh, they are not your friend, and you're not theirs. You treat them exactly like Paul, like John rather, tells us to treat them in second epistle of John. You're not even to pray for that crowd that will pin knife the Bible and destroy the Bible, lest you become partaker of their evil deeds. You're not to pray for them. You have no communion with them, no fellowship with them. You're not even to say, God bless you. The Bible says God speed, but that simply means God bless you. You're not to say that if a man doesn't believe the Bible. You just turn and walk away and say nothing. Don't you dare bless him. Don't you dare pray for him. If he's a Christ rejecter, a Bible denier, we want no part with that man. Now that's a narrow position. And I'm aware of that fact. But that's exactly where the Bible stands, and that's exactly where I stand. Had a man call me the other day, uh, wrote a letter, I'm sorry, wrote a letter to me the other day, and he said, I've recently come to Greenville, but he said, I can't find any fellowship. Well, that's a bit strange. He's got his church. What's wrong with fellowshipping with the deacons and the workers in his church? I think what he was talking about, I can't find any ministerial fellowship. Well, he was writing to the world's worst advisor. He didn't know it. But he wrote naively wrote a letter to me, and I thought to myself, I certainly can't help you, neither do I have any fellowship. I've never attended a Greenville Ministerial Union in my life, and don't plan to start. How can I sit down with a cigarette smoking and a pitch pay and write that? Or uh, Paul and Grace Pentecostal preacher, I can't do that. So I just don't go. Never have been, don't plan to start. I didn't bother to write this fellow back. He'll find out where well, well, I stand sooner or later. I just threw the letter away. But I thought to myself, fellowship with your people. You don't have to have ministerial fellowship. If you can have ministerial fellowship in the Bible and in the truth, I'm for that. But if you're going to have to compromise the Bible and the truth of the Bible upon ministerial fellowship, then we'll do without that. Right. I don't want that kind of fellowship. In fact, I'm forbidden in the Bible to cultivate that kind of fellowship. Man doesn't believe the Bible, we have nothing in common. I said nothing in common because I'm a believer. I believe literally the Bible. And a man doesn't take that position, then he and I have no common ground. And so I'm not to pray for him, I bid him Godspeed. But Paul said, I have better hopes for you of Thessalonica to the degree that I pray for you. We're bound to give thanks always to God for you because you're not like these that I've just been dealing with in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, not by any means. Now I want you to note some things that follow uh, this word of commendation from Paul. He says, brethren, beloved of the Lord, and that's God's children, real children, who've been born again and saved by grace and you're not ashamed of an old-fashioned Bible, an old-fashioned church, an old-fashioned grace. Why would you be ashamed of grace? Why would you be ashamed of an old-fashioned church? Why would you be ashamed of this 400-year KJV Bible? Now, I find nothing in it to make you ashamed of it. And yet we have folk that are ashamed of it these days. And they try to uh, uh, climb the uh, ministerial ladder, so to speak to great respectability, and they pass up we common people. They want no part with we common people. You need to get cultured and refined. No, oh, what you need is to get born again. Amen. The culture and refinement take care of itself down the road. But the only thing you need is to get saved by a good case, case of salvation. And salvation makes a difference in a man. <laughs> to the degree that Paul called these brethren, brethren beloved of the Lord. It doesn't take a wise man to figure out which of the two camps are better. The first camp, verses 1 through 12, or the second camp in verse 13. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. Well, anybody has enough judgment. No, that's the crowd that God's with. And that's the crowd Paul was with. And that's the crowd that he's addressing himself to. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. They are the church. They are the congregation of the redeemed. And I want to get just as close to that congregation and just as intimate and interwoven with that congregation as I can be. And I have been for long years, and I want to get even more bound up with the congregation of the redeemed. It's far better than the crowd to whom God gives a strong delusion. No comparison. But brethren, beloved of the Lord, 
Now about these beloved of the Lord, he goes on to say, I, I say this because God hath from the foundation chosen you to salvation. Now, isn't that an astounding thing? Uh, this, whatever that verse may mean, or that clause may mean, is based upon the infinite foreknowledge of God. I would that I could say that to you, so as you would never get away from it. If you can let it soak into your soul that God is, and besides him there is none other. If that can soak into you, if it can soak into your mind that God holds the reins of heaven's chariot in his hand, and he guides that chariot, he's in charge of it. God is the God of the local church. And his son is the instigator of it, the originator of it. His, his son is the bridegroom of it. And we are the bride of the eternal bride, bridegroom, the Lord Jesus. That's a wonderful thought. If it can just get a hold of you that God is and everything's all right in my father's house. Now, while, while God is upon his throne, the devil is jeering. And he's mocking and he's scoffing. And he levels tirade after tirade upon God and upon his people, upon his book, and upon his church. But God minds his business, keeps his eye upon the sparrow, loves his children, dearly beloved of the Lord. I read it. His eye is upon you. You're the apple of his eye. And he knew you from the beginning. And he chose you from the beginning in the infinite mind of God unto salvation. That staggers me. And I'm, I'm not preaching the hypercalvinism, God forbid. I don't believe in the idea of limited atonement. I don't accept the man-made idea of irresistible grace. But I do believe that God foreknows every believer in this building. And there's never been a day when he didn't know you. He knows you now. I think when I got saved as a lad, about the only people that shouted about it was God the Father. Not anybody in the earth did. Mama did, and I wish a thousand times she had, but she didn't. And my dad didn't, and my preacher didn't, my loved ones didn't. But there was a lad that came to God 64 years ago. Red-headed, freckle-faced, overgrown, gawky. And uh, nobody paid any attention to him. But I think when I started walking down the aisle, God said, quiet, just be quiet. That red-headed boy is coming to get saved. I knew him before the sun was. <laughs> and I think he shouted and clapped his hands. You don't get saved by surprise. You don't, you don't surprise God. I read in that verse about the brethren, beloved of God. God hath uh, from, the, from the beginning chosen you under salvation. Now, if that means anything to me, it means this, that I'm to give God the glory for everything I am. And I'm not much. And I can't give God much glory because I'm not much. But if I give anybody any glory, I must give it to God and I must acknowledge that I am what I am by the grace of God. And it's all based upon the infinite foreknowledge of God. Now, my soul, if God is that kind of a God, how can the devil gain the victory ultimately? Have you ever seen a big fella with a big hand and long arms and little fellas trying to get to him to kick him and to bite him and to fight him? And the big fella just puts his hand on top of the little fella and the little fella swinging both arms fervently trying to hit that big man, but he just can't quite reach him. Well, that's like the devil. God just puts his big hand on the head of the devil. And the devil swings at me, and kicks at me, and gnaws at me, and threatens me, and cusses me, and levels a tirade against me, but he can't get loose to get to me. Now, that's God's people. Now, we're in pretty good shape, brethren. The devil's fighting the losing cause. Brethren, beloved of God, because God has known you and chosen you unto salvation from the beginning. 
And when God saves you, you're saved and you're eternally saved. He'll never take his hand off you. A lot of battles you'll experience, but he'll never turn you over to the devil. That's one thing for sure. And when you came to God in faith believing, he knew that you would because he chose you for salvation and to salvation from the beginning, we're told. Then the second thing I find in that verse, uh, through sanctification of the Spirit. I read that same term in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. This is how God does it. Those foreknown in the mind of God from the beginning, chosen to salvation, are, are called through the Holy Spirit. The word sanctified means to set apart, set apart. And everyone known and chosen to salvation in the mind of God, the Holy Spirit lays his hand upon that one and calls them out of the broad road that leads to destruction. Amen. And sometimes when he lays his hand upon you, you kick and scream and resist. And then sometimes you break right down and say, praise God, hallelujah. But if you're chosen, the Holy Spirit sanctifies you uh, to faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to come in. And you can't get any other way. There's no way for a man to be saved apart from the ministry of God's blessed Holy Spirit. It says in that verse, the sanctification of the Spirit. Note the Spirit begins with capital S. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God. He separates you unto salvation. And that's how you get in. That's how I got in. And no sinner in Greenville can get saved apart from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He's a great soul winner. He's a great agent of conviction. And he's the agent that gives birth to your soul. When you come to Jesus, he gives birth to your soul into the family of God. You're sanctified through the Spirit. And then there's a third thing it says in that verse, and the belief of the truth. It's an amazing thing when God gets a hold of a sinner and gets you really under conviction. You don't have to persuade him to believe that Jesus died for him. He'll eagerly take hold of that like a drowned man takes hold of a rope. You tell him, believe on Jesus. Let the eunuch. And by the way, here's a verse left out of the NIV. Philip said to the eunuch, Dost thou believe in Jesus? And the eunuch said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, brother, that makes the bands in heaven stop playing. A sinner says that, business is going to pick up at him in a hurry. He'll get saved as sure as you're born. And that's what the eunuch said. I don't think that will be left out of the NIV, do you? The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You don't have any trouble causing a man to believe in Jesus when he's sanctified by the Spirit under salvation. He'll believe because it's not only the Spirit calling him, but he's led also to the belief of the truth. And then there's one other thing in verse number 14. Whereunto he called you and me and all the others of us by the gospel. Now here's the good news. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of truth. The gospel. You hear about the gospel. And if you are uh, convicted by the spirit, that gospel will penetrate. If God is dealing with you, that gospel will get down in your soul and tear you up and make you uneasy. And you don't sleep well at night. Things don't run good on the job. And you get so miserable in yourself until you have to find the preacher or find the Bible and show me how to be saved. Because that's involved. The preaching of the gospel is involved in the salvation of every sinner. And you have to hear. So then faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. You have to hear that gospel and believe that gospel. And if you'll hear it and believe it, then what God started out to do becomes a blessed reality, the salvation of your soul. Look again. We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. How? Through the sanctification of the Spirit. How? Through the belief of the truth. How? How? by the gospel, by our gospel, to the obtaining of glory. Wherefore, therefore, 
in verse 15. Because of verses 13 and 14, therefore, brethren, same group he's speaking to, brethren, stand fast. Therefore, brethren, hold the traditions, the truth that I brought to you in word and in spirit and my epistles. Hold on to that. And champion the Bible. Lift up a blood-stained banner. Oh, but preacher, nobody will believe that gospel anymore. There is no other. And my soul, there shall never be any other. You're going to believe the report. Isaiah cried, who hath believed our report? Just one report. And that one report, Christ died for our sins. And you must come to believe that in order to be saved. That's God's way. I didn't make it. I'm just preaching it. That's God's way. And every man that's ever gotten saved was begotten by the hearing of faith and believing the truth of God's word. May we stand.